First one is that it isn't zoning and it doesn't address land use. That's uh, not true. Uh, land use is part of it. We just don't let it drive our, all of our decision making. We don't begin with it, we include it. Uh, second one is that it's all about graphics. Uh, you often hear this, that well, you know, yeah, those form-based codes are great, but you know, all they do is just put things in graphic form. Uh, that could not be further from the truth. They use graphics to take the place of sentences when you can. For example, like this, to show, you know, when we're talking about this environment, this particular zoning district, and you can see just in that one image, the kind of character that we're looking for, as opposed to uh, the conventional zoning statements, which are long and they use words like harmonious and compatible, and those are really hard to define. Uh, we just put it out there in a graphic format whenever we can. The next common uh, misconception is that it dictates architecture. I've worked on many and some uh, require architecture very specifically and um, many do not. So here's an example of architecture requirements by style on a code I worked on in Whittier, California. And you can see here, it's, it's by style, it breaks down all the, the requirements of, of uh, what that architectural style needs to do, the characteristics, the materials, the proportions, and the reason that why cities choose the, the, this level of requirement is because they have this kind of place. Their form of character is so historic that not going to this level of detail would, would mean that new investment would somehow have to, have to figure this out. The next one is that form-based codes are a template that make you fit your community to it. And I always like to say, no, that's conventional zoning. So if you look at this diagram about just the layers that make up urbanism, you know, from the blocks that the lots sit on and where buildings are and where activity centers are and streets and transit and bikes and pedestrians and parks, all those are layers. We recognize these layers that make cities and because we recognize them, we can apply rules to them and start to apply a community's vision. Uh, another one is that uh, form-based codes require high density and mixed use, just that because you do a form-based code, you're gonna have to do this. Somehow it's just gonna have to happen. And so when communities uh, are faced with this misconception of, oh, well, we have to require, we have to fit in high density and mixed use everywhere, it's not true. Um, the better way to say it is that these codes allow you to identify where you want to put high density, if you want to use that term, and mixed use, and how to do it. Form-based codes can't work with design guidelines. Um, that's not true. I, I was just showing you earlier about architectural style. A part of those standards are guidelines, and, and part of that content was standards. Uh, so just to say that more clearly, uh, sometimes you'll identify things that you want to say are mandatory, and other things that you have as guidelines. We don't recommend this, but sometimes cities want that. And the test is to use guidelines when the standard can't ca capture the qualitative aspect of what the community is looking for. If the standard can't do that, then make it a guideline. Form-based codes remove good day-to-day -day thinking. And um, another way to say this is that planners somehow are left out of the loop. I've heard a lot of my, my public sector friends say, well, you know, it, when you guys do this, it's all figured out. We can't, we have nothing to do anymore. Uh, two answers for that. The first is uh, you as the community and you as the public sector planner are very involved in crafting these codes. Um, and then on the day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, this is still zoning. It needs humans to operate it. So you as the public sector planner, the community member, are still going to have to interpret that thing every day. The next one on, this, on the um, screen here is that it's too expensive. And I like to use this picture to illustrate this. This is the Tehachapi Code. The night of the adoption with the city council, we put up the old Title 22 on the left and the new Title 22 on the right. And it, the, the staff just wanted us to take this photograph because it was, it was so alarming. They'd been working with the one on the left for all, a lot of years. And then the one on the right was, was brand new and just a third the size of the old one. And, and yes, they're more expensive if you just look at uh, well, if you don't compare them fairly, a fair comparison is to say, uh, look at all the time it takes people to interpret and, um, and work with the conventional zoning code and get legal interpretations, um, go to the planning commission to get a ruling. Well, okay, now we understand. Take all that time, take the time that it takes a planner to become proficient, or as I like to say, a black belt, in, in using the zoning code. Take all that time 
And then take all the time you, you take to prepare guidelines to help interpret your zoning code. All those, all those things. And then now add them in comparison to a zoning code that's, that's prepared under form-based standards.